just one verse, Romans chapter 3, verse 31. We have seen a lot already in this book, especially about the guilt of man before God, the sinfulness of man before God, how that Christ is our justification. But immediately proceeding here, we've seen how that God justifies us through faith without the deeds of the law. And then in verse 31, this objection is raised. Paul being a very wise man and knowing what the opposition will question him about. He, after he tells us that God justifies us through faith, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid day we establish the law. Yeah. Hopefully I can make sense of this to you all today because there's a lot of confusion and I can't say I fully understand all of it. Maybe Brother Stephen could elaborate some on it, I don't know. But he begins by saying, do we then make void the law through faith? You know, that is, do we make the law idle or inactive or do away with it? I know the first reaction most Christians say, yes, the law is done away with. The law has been abolished. And in some senses it has been, and we'll see that. We'll do base out Ephesians 2, and we'll see that later on over there. But that is the basis by which many Christians say, oh, the law has no use today. That the law is really a, just an Old Testament thing and we don't need to worry about it. You know, the average Christian would say there's no use for the law under the new covenant, but Galatians 3 24 very plainly tells us that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So, do we make void the law through faith? So, it might be the popular teaching today, but Paul says, God forbid. So absolutely not that we. We do not make the law void through faith, but it says, yea, rather we establish it. As we make it firm, we cause it to stand. But this is one of the places where the quote, Messianic Jews and Hebrew Roots movement base their position on going back under the law, keeping all aspects of it, but yet that's not what Paul's arguing here either. Right. They would say, yeah, here it fairly plainly says we we must keep the law. We must, the law is established because of faith. But Paul is not saying that we need to uh, just go back to observing the law and all of its ceremonies and such as that. Yet there's a large and growing number of people that would say, yes, that's what we need to do. So they kind of missed the whole point about that justification is not through the law. Though. All right. And the ones I've been associated with, they I went as far as to eventually deny Christ and even the whole New Testament. So yeah. that type of thinking always is a slippery slope that doesn't lead us closer to Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's go over to the Ephesians for a moment. <clears throat> Ephesians 2 where I mentioned it might be a little short today, but I Want to try to explain this in a way that makes sense. Ephesians 2, verse 13 through 17. Here Paul has been telling us as Gentile believers how that we were really hopeless and far off without Christ, how we were not, as he said, we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world, verse 12. And then verse 3 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath broken, who hath both one, had both, excuse me, who hath both made one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for making himself between one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. It is Christ when he came and he made the sacrifice. He says he broke down that middle wall partition. He right. removed that which was kept us from coming to God. <laughs> Especially us as Gentiles, we could not come to God. The only way really for us, for any Gentile to have salvation and 
to be considered one of God's people was to become observant of the Jewish law. But yet Christ removed that from us, that we have direct access to him now through the person of Christ. Boy. We see that in type when the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom when Christ died on the cross. But before that, we had to have a Jewish high priest to enter in and to make the sacrifice for us. We had Christ being our high priest entered into the holies of holies and made sacrifice for our sins in the presence of God. You know that, and in doing so, he removed that which was kept us from going to God. Now he says we have access to the throne of grace. Because we turn over to Colossians 2, we'll see the same thought here. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14. After he tells us that we were dead, trespasses and sins, and God quickened us together, he says, let's go ahead and, well, he tells us we were buried in baptism, and we've been raised by faith like Christ was raised. Verse 13 says, and you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Okay. Uh, Christ removed the what we call some of the ceremonial law that was against us, really the guilt of the law that was against us as well. And he says here he nailed it to the cross. Uh, I think sometimes we're we're not careful we'll take that which was nailed to the cross try to pick it back up again. <laughs> whether it be our sins or whether it be trying to please God by our works or yeah. any of those type of things, but Christ removed that. Yeah. As we've seen previously in our studies in Romans, there's no, <coughs> no deeds, whether the law or what man, what man considers good works that could justify us in the sight of God. That no flesh is justified in his sight is evident, so just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. So Paul writes in another place, the Christ has removed all that are our sin, our <coughs> dead state in sin, our wickedness. He has removed that guilt from us as well, and he nailed all that to the cross. That we might be able to have righteousness and justification through him. You know that <coughs> those laws of having to make this sacrifice and that sacrifice for this sin or the Make this offering and that offering, all that was done away in Christ. Now we'll go to Acts chapter 15, and I think one of the clearest passages here on how we are to view the law under the new covenant. We're going to read quite a bit here, but for the whole context, I'd like to read verses 1 through 20. If you're familiar with the the context, Paul had been about his visionary journeys and many Gentiles have been saved and there was some, some confusion, if you will, about circumcision and the law of Moses and what it played or what part it played in the life of a believer. Well, this is really no new thing that we deal with today with the with those who teach you got to keep the law. We see the Galatians struggle with it, and even the early church here. <clears throat> right. Verse 1, it says, Certain men which came from the media taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the man, manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. We know very clearly now that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything in Christ. But we have these here that were teaching you must be circumcised to be saved. And that's really nothing short of a works based salvation. Amen. In verse 2 he says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dis disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through 
Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come up to Jerusalem, they were received the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Here we have the same same thing. You, know, you, you gotta be circumcised, you gotta keep the law of Moses. Okay. The biggest problem with that line of thinking is it always leads to you justifying yourself by your words. Right. That's right. But here they in the next verses they consider this matter. It says the apostles and the elders came together for a consider of this matter, and when there had been much disputing. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, do you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe? And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and putting no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. See, that is the key, that he purifies our hearts by faith and not by our works. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, were prone to thinking that it was their works which purified them. It was their works that made them right with God. Paul came to realize after his conversion that all of that meant nothing if he didn't have the faith of Christ. Amen. Verse number 10 goes on to say, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor ye were able to bear? This is a, that's the question I don't understand why people can't get through their heads today. The Jews weren't able to keep the law. The Pharisees, even despite all their self-righteousness, did not keep the law fully. None of the New Testament believers ever were able to keep the law fully. Only Christ was ever able to. <laughs> Verse 11, Peter says, but we believe that the Lord or through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Lord, by grace are you saved through faith, and not of works. Then he goes on to say, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracle and wonders God has wrought among the Gentiles by them. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men, brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, or Simon, hath declared how God the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this we, or, and to this agree the words of the people, prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name was called, say the Lord who doeth all these things. And God, this is the God turning to the Gentiles. And we ought to be especially thankful today that God was pleased to turn His grace towards us. Amen. Man. Verse number 18, James continues on saying, No, unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world, all His works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Here, the conclusion is that not that they were to keep the law and be circumcised, not that they were to go through some ritual, but rather just to keep themselves from these things and that by grace they would be saved. Or should I say that by grace they would be saved and then they should keep from these things. Well, that's right. <clears throat> so we are really just the same as these Gentile believers here. That we are saved by grace and then we should serve him. But it's not the other way around. It's not that we serve him and then we're saved by grace. It's not that we need to keep the law to its fullest and dot every I and cross every T. But Rather just do that which is according to the word of God and we will be saved by grace if we have faith in Christ. So there are some debates about how we should view the law today. Some say, as we've pointed out, that you should keep the law to its fullest. And I don't believe the scriptures teach that. Others say there's no use for the law at all today. I don't believe that's what the scriptures teach either. 
The other two more prominent views are that we should keep everything that's not explicitly done away with in the New Testament, or that we should only keep that which is repeated in the New Testament. I'm not completely convinced on one way or the other, but I, I kind of lean towards that we, the last point that we should keep that which is repeated because of what James says here. He doesn't say, well, don't keep this part of the law, or don't worry about circumcision. He says, just worry about these certain things. That's right. We have a great liberty in Christ. <clears throat> we need to be careful about that liberty. We need to not go so far one way that we are legalistic in our view, but we ought not to go so far the other way that we we have no real good works about us at all. Right. We, we can turn over real quick to Galatians. I forgot to put in my note in Galatians in chapter number five. <coughs> I think we're all familiar with the end part of this chapter. We talked about the works of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. In the beginning part, he's talking about our liberty in Christ. In verse number 13, he says, For brethren, ye have been called not unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. For the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For we have been called our liberty, he says, and we have freedom in Christ, that we're not under that yoke of bondage, as he says in verse number one. But this liberty, he says, it is not that we can just live however we want to. And grace and faith are not a license to sin. You know, some might teach that today. Some certainly view grace is that way. That well, I'm saved by grace. I'm once saved, always saved. And what does it matter how I live? But, well, this liberty ought to drive us to serve one another and serve God. And that's what Paul is arguing here in Galatians 5. We are to use this liberty not for occasion of the flesh, or not to do what the flesh pleases, but rather, he says, but by love serve one another. Mm -hmm. I know love is a, a touchy subject in our society today. We have the, the LGBT and so on group that say love is love, and yet they don't know what real love is. You know, to, if we really love one another, we would serve one another. If we really love God, we would serve God. Mm -hmm. If we would do that, we would fulfill the law anyway. That's right. So what does, going back to our text here, what does Paul mean that we establish the law through faith? Say there's a few ways that the law is still intact today. The law requires atonement for sin, and Christ is our atonement through faith. We are certainly not obligated to keep the law for righteousness and justification, but we are obligated to do works of righteousness because of Christ. Faith without works is dead, being alone, James says. And the law still shows us our sinfulness and need of a Savior. We saw the law as our schoolmaster bring us to Christ. As Romans 7 will point out to us later that the law just showed Paul how great a sinner he really was. And the law still demands perfect obedience today, but the difference is it's either as a combination of the unbeliever or it's fulfilled in Christ for the believer. Mm -hmm. And certainly we are free from the curse of the law, but that's only because Christ became a curse for us. Yeah. <laughs> the law certainly is by no means useless or insignificant today. Rather, all of its demands are fulfilled in Christ on our behalf by faith. I think that is what Paul is saying when we, he says the law is established through faith. But mm. Through the person of Christ, it is established and fulfilled, and hopefully only through Him can we to meet or meet all His demands. Amen. Really, the only options left today are either you try to fulfill the law's demands and you'll be in condemnation, or Christ fulfilled it for you through faith. 
and sadly many today will go about trying to do enough good works to be saved and doing this and doing that and all that equates to is they will stand before God condemned because they sought to justify themselves rather than justification through Christ. So we don't, we're not going to go back in our study, but we saw very clearly in the previous verses here in Romans 3 that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. God is both just and justifier of him which believes in Christ. That it's by his grace and through the blood of Christ that we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So I guess the, the law is still has a purpose. It still shows us our sinfulness. It still condemns the unbeliever. And it still must be fulfilled, but the only way it can be fulfilled is by faith in Christ. Amen. So if you're not saved here today, all we can do is point you to Christ and faith in Him. That's right. Otherwise, you'll stand before God guilty under the full weight of the law. And I don't know how Miserable that's going to be, but I know it's going to be an eternity of suffering in the lake of fire. But thanks be to God for His grace and His the gift of salvation which comes through Christ. Amen. We'll go ahead and close with that thought. Amen. Amen. Amen.